Is everybody able to read the reading of Hosea this week, more or less? More or less. Okay, great. So, um, let's start. Let's start without me yapping. Let's start uh, your initial impressions with the book. What do you think its point is, and uh, what, what things did you take away from it when you read this text this week? I started reading it. I didn't look at the Bible study, Bible. So, of course, the first four chapters of the Hosea, and then don't mm-hmm. hear mm-hmm. about them anymore. But it, that's kind of the first thing that kind of happens. And then, in my mind, it gets into okay, God's mad again because the people aren't behaving themselves and you know, they're, they're worshiping out of the idols and all of this and that. You know, kind of another. Another situation, another book in the Bible that involves all that. But then, uh, after reading the kind of the Bible project, talking about how God tells Hosea, even though your wife uh, cheated around on you, you got to dig up with your wife. You know, do this, you got to do that. And kind of parallels that with God again supporting the people of Israel, so kind of comparing Hosea making up with his wife and God making up with his wives as far as. We welcome them and yeah. supporting them, that kind of thing. So it kind of, that all kind of made sense. But it wasn't, of course, until I looked at the Bible project that kind of made a little bit more sense. Uh-huh. Great. Thanks, Mark. And my else? Your reactions to the text are. Didn't like it. Didn't like it. Didn't like it. Well, I have a running issue with. Yeah. That, that the, the origins of the abuse of women come straight from, in my mind, from places like Ezekiel, places like Hosea, and I understand that it's it's our human beings' unfaithfulness to God that has upset. I am very saddened that that unfaithfulness has to be portrayed by a woman's unfaithfulness, mm-hmm. not. Not the guys, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, even Israel is, is known as the bride of the of the bridegroom, so it's a female connotation, and it's a woman that's, you know, doing all the whoredom and all the betrayal and all this kind of stuff. And and Hosea goes and rescues, and yes, God, you got to take that back. But the the hierarchy that's presented with God and the male, and even still, they are the only ones that can make that female better. And and I just struggle mightily with that. Yeah. yeah. Hard, uh, culturally. It's, hard it's culturally very different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is a very different culture, but unfortunately, in my mind, what's happened is that those are vestiges of that still exist. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and I think, um, I used to be able to say that's the time of, but it's harder for me to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for giving that voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, anybody else? Before we jump into it. I thought it was interesting. This was just a personal thing, but reading that whole parallel of the whole adultery thing or whatever, when I experienced it out of the clear blue, I remember thinking, is this what Jesus feels like when we, you know, are... And it was so ironic that I was all devastated and whatever, and the last thing that I would have thought would be to make that parallel, but I, and I never read anything you know, like this, I never knew that was something that was in the Bible. So I was like, it's weird that reading it now, I'm like, boy, where did that come from that I had thought of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 That puts a piece of redemption on <coughs> yeah. Any Anybody else want to weigh in as we're just doing initial thoughts with it? Okay. All right. So we're... Uh, Yep. Uh, so um, as we jump into Hosea, we have some interesting situations. So let me ask you this question. Is Gomer, um, is she portrayed, do you think, as his, 
All right. I know. Yeah, we've talked about. We've mentioned. We made mention of it, but just for the text itself sake, um, is she his wife and cheating, or is she a prostitute, or was she loose before he married her, and then he married her, and she takes a different path? What did you kind of gather from what the text was saying about the you know, relationship between Hosea and Gomer? I, when I read it, I interpreted it as she was already promiscuous, mm -hmm. and she just continued to be promiscuous. Okay. And God said she should do that. He should do that. It actually says that. I mean, like God said, go find a promiscuous yeah. woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's see. <laughs> Yeah. So on one on one hand, you wonder if uh, <laughs> can I even say this? I mean, is Hosea making this up? I mean, well, God told me go marry a loose woman. Well, um, it's, uh, that's a that's a hard one. Uh, no. Um, but anyway, no. It, it's it's strange because so you have to wonder is uh, at one level in biblical interpretation is the book. Really, uh, I mean, did Hosea really have this vision as a real person who has this? I mean, he was a real prophet, but did he have this vision to, to, that God told him to do this, and so he did it? Or is the whole thing a construct of analogy of this prophet who maybe he does have this relationship, but the whole thing is meant to be analogy for Israel and God? Um, which I lean more in that direction, but you have the situation where God tells him to go marry a, and, and as I put in the notes, uh, esit zenuum, which is translated, never translated as prostitute. So it's, it, it's translated all over the map in English, you know, harlot, whore, uh, somebody who's loose. Um, but the it's it's really interesting because it says he's going to do this and he's going to um, you know they have all these children and then later in chapter three Hosea's going and buying purchasing Gomer to be his so did he marry her in chapter one and chapter three is describing chapter one or is she a loose woman that he is seeing and then she's with somebody else and he goes and purchases her for himself. You see where I'm going with this? Uh, you have this uh, aspect where all three of her kids, uh, Jezreel, uh, Ru uh, Lo, yes. Thank you. I mean, nobody's going to... It would be hard. I, prophets do weird things, right? But this is, this is another layer of weird. Uh, you're going to name your kid after a valley of slaughter uh, where there's uh, profane bloodshed at, by one of the kings of Israel. You're going to name your other kid as not my kid. And you're going to name your third kid or your second kid unloved. I hope this is an, a metaphor. Um, are they are they Hosea's kids? So all right, let's let's read through this. Where does yours say that they're his children? Three, uh, verse 3 uh, in number 1, in chapter 1. So he went and took Gomer. And she conceived and bore him a son. Yeah, yeah. And then. She, but then in 6 it says she conceived she again, again and bore a daughter. But it didn't say that it was her son. Right. True. And here, yeah, you have uh, that Loruma, which means unloved or unwanted. And then the third one. Um, she had weaned. She conceives in verse eight, yeah. and it's, you're not my, yeah. you're not mine. So I think it's that particularly that second and third child where, what do you mean you're not mine? Well, 
you've got this promiscuous woman who's supposed to be faithful to Hosea. This is my kid. Okay, I had a different take. If, if it's an allergy, yeah. um, that the whole thing represents Israel's unfaithfulness. Yeah. So, right. Israel, you have been so awful, you are no longer my people. I am done with you. Yes. So, um, so I don't know if it really matters the authenticity or if, Go or if Jose is the well, so I'm going to I'm going to push a little bit on that because I think the the um, I agree with you that on the one hand, God is saying you're not my people anymore uh, to Israel. But on the other hand, if Israel is a metaphor, if, if Hosea and Gomer are the metaphor for Israel and God, <coughs> if Israel is Gomer and is sleeping around with other nations and other gods, then you don't you you're unrecognizable as my children. You you've got other dancing partners, mm -hmm. and have taken you away from me, and I'm gonna purchase you back. I'm gonna come get you back and be faithful to you, and we're gonna work this out. But um, you're and and we see this kind of in the Torah. Your children, you know, in the wilderness, your your kids don't know who I am. You got to teach them my ways. Uh, this next generation wasn't in Egypt. They don't remember what I did for you. And you haven't told them. So how would they know? So I think that paternity issue or, or ne nebulousness in the book of Hosea is, in for me, it's intentional. Uh, the first one, I think you're right. She conceives him a son. But I don't know. Now I have to look at the Hebrew here. But I don't know if that pronoun of his... <laughs> is with the other two. And it wouldn't be surprised me if it wasn't, because... Um, so you're suggesting that, that um, God then would not take those people back? No, no. God's promise later is, 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 is to, is, is you to know... purchase them, yeah. Hosea's going and getting Gomer, and he's raising these kids as okay. his own. Okay. However, they are... So you could say, all right, um, let me just take it to a modern analogy. You watch Montel or uh, Jerry Springer or whatever. You got the, you got the parents, and, the, and they bring on some random guys. And there's this weepy lady on the TV saying, well, I don't know. I slept with three different partners, but I'm not sure which one of them is a dad. But, well, we're going to find out. We're going to have the unveiling. We'll do the, they'll all take paternity tests. And then some guy finds out that this is his DNA, he's the dad, and he's, wow, well, that's not my kid, you're, you know, loose. So we have this today, right, uh, it played out for, unfortunately, entertainment and money, but um, the idea of unloved, well, somebody's your dad, but they're not going to be your father, really. They don't care about you. I mean, you, you could almost read the New Testament parable. There are, there are hired hands, and there's a good shepherd. The good shepherd cares about the sheep. The hired hands could care less. They're just here for a paycheck. So that same kind of parallel of uh, whoever fathered this child, uh, I'm going to take care of it, the prophet and God, but... Uh, Somebody didn't want it. So I think that level of, I, mean, I guess I would say, why else, why else make the, uh, uh, all this language about her being such a, a floozy if, if that isn't an important detail to the children's origins as they relate to Israel? Does that make sense? I mean, there's a lot of, yeah, to our dismay and maybe, but there's a... That God's going to take care of them and bring them in. Yeah, they've Regardless wandered. Of, hopefully, you're going to help teach them and so that they know how to be, be faithful to God. Yeah. That's what's important. Yeah. So, and this whole thing's about the northern kingdom, right? So, it's all about Israel. Five different kings during the period that Hosea is talking about. He comes right after Amos, who we haven't read yet, but Amos warns Israel. And Amos's warnings are really pointed. 
like we talk a lot about idolatry in the, the prophets. Amos is going to get very specific. Listen, you guys have multiple homes. You have ivory beds. You have all kinds of makeup and cosmetics and, and outward appearances, gold earrings and gold hoops and gold rings and staffs. And, and you, you, you worry about your, how your appearances are. And it, it's all about money, prestige, and wealth. And yet you forget with all this success, Israel's doing great. You forget the marginalized and poor in your communities. And, and God says, how can you forget these people? And I'm going to bring you back to a reality check of what matters and at the hands of another nation. That, Amos is very vague about that. Hosea says, it's Assyria, and you're going to be in trouble now. Um, so it's just kind of a, he comes linearly later than a prophet we're going to read later on. But so... Um, we're reading kind of the end of the, the latter three quarters of the story, and we're going to start the beginning later on in our Minor Prophets readings. Does that make sense? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, um, but then the reason why I think it's such a strong argument for metaphor interpretation, whether Hosea may very well have married somebody who was known as a loose girl, but. As Mark mentioned, he complete, they, both him and Gomer, who are the center of the story for the first four chapters, can drop off completely. They're gone. They're not even mentioned again, either one of them. Uh, and the whole rest of the story is about Israel and Israel's infidelity. Um, even some of the first four chapters is about that. And, and Hosea mentions lying and, and murderous people who steal, who commit adultery. Um, lines of bloodshed from one generation to the next, violence. And something that struck me really powerfully in Hosea 2 was Hosea saying there's, in verses 2 and 3, there's only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. You break all bonds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. And because of this, you know, human interaction and sin, the land dries up, and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field and the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea are swept away. So from human greed and violence affects not just humanity, but the rest of creation. You'll probably hear about this this spring. Um, but there's a price that all create. If, if, if we go back to the garden and Adam and Eve in that kind of uh, symbolic, you're supposed to care for, be stewards of this land. Uh, or Genesis 1, you're supposed to have dominance over the other species and rule over them. Well, how are you ruling? And if we're ruling with uh, violence or greed are, are, are really driving forces, then there's a price that creation that we're, we're called to watch over by God. There's a price to everything is affected by humanity's choice. There's a, kind of a web you know, the, um, the Lakota say everything's connected, uh, and they use a spider web. Of uh, The spider is that symbol of that web. You know, one strand is pulled, and it affects the rest of the web's integrity. That kind of idea is very strong in the book of Hosea, and uh, so we find that in here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... Based on what you read from Hosea, what is, what is, is there good news in this book? <laughs> or is it just a foregone conclusion? Is Israel just doomed and it's done and God is done with them? What do you think? From the little bit that I'm reading, it's, like, it's almost like the same old, same old. God always forgives his, all, forgives his rule and the people under the sun is, yes, he would say, yes. But at the end of the day, he supports them. Yes, yes. <coughs> so that's, that's the bottom line. I think that's why what's going on over there now, even in the New Testament, there's everything seems a lot more intense in my mind. I mean, I'm kind of 
to read the Old Testament about God and Israel and the people all these years, generations, centuries, and now all the fighting going on over there. Um, it just kind of adds to the, to the story. Mm. So, uh, taking up uh, aside from the modern state of Israel, because there's a little different dynamic there, um, I will get to that in a second. But Israel as a political state, as a nation, does not recover. This is the end. Uh, they won't be Israel like they've been biblically here until the treaty after the Second World War. And it's still, it, that's a, a recreation of the state of Israel. But it's not what they were. So, yes, there's a message of God's fidelity and that God won't forget God's people. But Assyria essentially destroys a civilization known as Israel. Um, Judah adopts that title. We think of the Israelites because the tribe of Judah and Benjamin remain. But the northern ten tribes, you know, they're all cease to be. The, the people are, are exiled. And it's really interesting to me, I hadn't really thought about it a lot until reading Hosea again, that we talk about the exile. And when we say that in terms of Bible studies, we talk about the people of Jerusalem and of Judah being exiled to the rivers of Babylon, the Babylonian exile, right? But the Israelites, the northern tribes, are all exiled too. But we don't talk about that. And it's a greater exile. There's, much, there's many more Israelites. And their exile, they don't return for the most part. They're spread out, the diaspora. They're spread out and scattered like a pool ball hitting and you know all the balls going to different uh, edges of the, the table. Uh, and they don't ever come back. You know, they don't ever get re-racked. So it's... Uh, and then, you know, kind of then bring it back to Mark's point and I guess a point of discussion is I think about all the times in history that the Jewish people, uh, Hebrew people identified as a people, not just as a religion, have been uh, destroyed or tried to be wiped out. Uh, Syria, Babylon, Rome, uh, Persia. Uh, then you have, uh, well, you had the slave in Egypt. Then you have Stalin and Hitler and um, anti-Semitism in, in the States. Uh, it, it, many nations have had anti-Semitic you know, anti cleansings and attacks over the years. We have shootings in synagogues today in Pittsburgh two years ago and uh, you know attacks within the last we've had things in synagogues locally from people um, with Nazi signs and symbols. So this thing, this, this isn't dead. So the idea, the baseline that God doesn't forget God's people, whether they have a border on a map or a nation, has remained true, whereas the, um, what they imagined that to be might have been very different. Does that make sense? They might have imagined that Israel is going to come back, and it doesn't. But God remains faithful to them as a people, though they're spread out and scattered. And also may speak to why they didn't see Jesus as the Savior deliverer, <coughs> because they're still spread out. They have not been brought back together. And even then, they weren't. But even, and now they still are not. Mm -hmm. you know, they're still waiting. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, Karen, because it also triggers another thought I hadn't had before, but as you're saying, recognition of Jesus as Savior, you have the author of the book of Revelation who is Jewish, not necessarily, possibly John the disciple, but maybe a disciple of his, uh, by another, another John. Uh, but either way, wh whatever the authorship, he's Jewish. And what if one of his end apocalyptic visions is that all the Israelites come back to the uh, Hedron Valley and uh, to Armageddon. There's a battle, but Israel is reunited. 
and then the nations come to fight Israel and God, and then the nations also then worship because of Israel's example to God. So it is that reclaiming of what's lost here. So it's kind of interesting. So there was a discussion, I don't remember if it was here or if it was somewhere else in church. Um, were, are the Jews still waiting for the Messiah? Yeah. Because yeah, last week, and Michelle said that, no, she said absolutely not. They never were waiting for one. And then I was going back and reading, and I'm like, but we keep reading things where that does come in. But she said absolutely not. Uh, I would disagree. Uh, when we went to Israel, our Jewish guides s said, hey, uh, you know, the East Gate. All, I mean, think about where all the burial sites in Jerusalem are. They're all on the east side of the city. Why? Because the Messiah is going to come from the east, to come from Mount Zion. Well, why would, you, why would you bury everybody there if you don't anticipate something? Uh, why would the Muslims block up that side of the wall to say, man, you're not going to, no Messiah is coming through these gates because we're going to block it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we're arguing about this stuff. I mean, the, in the grand scheme of things, but uh, well, well, next time we have a joint class, we'll, we'll maybe duke that out a little bit because uh, we have a different, I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but I, I would disagree. Um, yeah, no, it was because I was because that threw me off. I was like, I was, I left really confused. <coughs> so, I mean, I mean, I'm sure there are some Jewish pockets that don't, but the Hebrew Bible is still the Hebrew Bible, and it's still predictive of a Messiah. Yeah, well, that's what I kept going back to each of these times that we we're talking about the prophecy. It came back to that; it was in there. Mm -hmm. So I thought I, and I always thought that. They were waiting. Meanwhile, I'll talk to some of my Jewish friends and synagogue and see what they say. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I've heard many Jewish folks say that just, they're just, this hasn't come yet. So, so I don't know. I don't know. Without getting too much into a geography lesson, if you take a look at this state of Israel now and mm -hmm. the square miles, how much bigger was it? at one point. I mean, is there, is there anything in the Bible or history as far as geographically how, how big it once was at one time compared to the size it is now? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you can look at different conquests, uh, particularly around David. Um, David and King, David through King Ahab. You're going to hear, or you, you have to look at the battles they fight and who they conquer and where it says the lines, the boundary lines of Israel are drawn. So you're gonna, uh, there's times when it overlaps parts of Syria today. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna overlap parts of, um, let's see here. I went into like a, a ramp into the Euphrates River at some point too. I mean, the Euphrates mentioned early on in the Bible as far as it's mentioned, but it's land of Cana. Um, and so the question is, you know, where God gives the land of promise. The Jordan is a pretty strong boundary for Israel most of its history. Are there times when they fight battles on the other side of the Jordan? Yeah. Um, David would probably, David and Ahab are the, the heights of Israel's power and boundaries. But there are Bibles that have maps that show you ancient Israel versus modern Israel. And so you can see those. Um, you, you, you can be able to find that yeah. with some relatives. I actually have a Bible atlas that you can borrow if anybody wants to look at it and you can check it out. Um, so, but one, that's one of the big challenges of, so Jerusalem originally is not a Jewish city, right? It's, it, it becomes the city of David because he conquers it from the Jebusites. Who are the Jebusites? Well, they're Arab. We would call them today great, great, great grandfathers and mothers of Palestinians. They're, they are original inhabitants of Palestine. So when we talk about the conflict between Palestinian Jews, uh, Palestinian Arabs, uh, Muslims, Palestinian Christians, and the nation of Israel, you know, there's a power dynamic of whose land is this? 
and that land has switched hands. There's been, over the years, I mean, the Six Day War, a lot of the battles over, you know, um, who. That's why. Uh, that's why when the embassy moved to Jerusalem, it's such a big politically charged issue in the Middle East because um, the Palestinians and and Muslims recognize that <coughs> Jerusalem is still theirs in their mind's eye and not, or at least half of it should be theirs and half of it should be Israel's. But, you know, they're fighting and, and God is, and so there's a religious aspect to it. There's a historical aspect to it. There's inter, uh, the interfaith play. Um, and then there's some, some political, modern political uh, settling and you know who can farm what who has what rights who has what medical or health care or water uh, systems and so uh, there's there's a lot of gray <laughs> anybody wants to say one's the right well these are the good guys and these are the bad guys well over the decades and over the centuries there's been atrocities committed both ways and but there's certainly a, a dynamic of power with you know Israel's military capability versus what the Palestinians have uh, very <coughs> disparate so um, but that's not us when everybody just says well you know it's one way or the other uh, and we're on the sidelines looking at a long-standing conflict be that has a lot of layers so it's it's tough to, I think, um, have clarity uh, that is doesn't have some challenges to it from whichever uh, party you're you're talking about. There's some challenges there. So I have, I yeah. have a question for okay so. Because it really threw me that whole like waiting for a Messiah or whatever. But you know how um, we read on and on the genealogy, so specific to make sure that you know we said okay this was coming from the line of David and all of that. So then, are there still Jewish people that are trying to continue that line that are still saying, you know, even modern day we're still waiting for this Messiah that's going to be from the line of David that. If That's they a great don't think that that was fulfilled, like it would seem like at this point it was so carefully and so <laughs> over and you know, like we read that and it was so very specific to make sure that all of that genealogy went through. That I would think if they were still waiting and they were still trying to fulfill all of that, I would think that you know nowadays they would have the DNA and they'd be like these are the people and it's going to be from this line. I would just, you know what I mean? Like it seems like that would be. It's a great a question. Big deal to them right now. It's a great question. Is there some lab somewhere where they're <laughs> trying to do advanced genealogical testing of the Davidic line, uh, bloodlines? You know, I don't. I don't know. That's a good what question. What tribe is David from? <sighs> Hang on. Benjamin? I saw this from Benjamin. David. Hold on. We'll find it here. David comes on the scene. Where is David first called with his brothers? 18? No. Oh. Where uh, J Samuel goes and anoints him with his brothers, and he's going to go through the line of brothers. And uh, Here we go. Here we go. First Samuel 16, just one second, where does he say, up, up. send you the Jesse the Bethlehemite, alright, so what is Jesse, Jesse is from what line, that's a great question, And it, well, well, let's go back to Ruth then. Book of Ruth, right? Because Boaz is uh, yeah. Boaz is Jesse's grandfather. It would make sense because Judah is the line of kings, but and the most of the Jews of 
around today are around June, I believe. So, <clears throat> let's see here. That's a great question. For those of you at home, sorry, I know this is making for riveting. Uh, all right, Obed, Boaz from uh, the line of, I'm sorry, Matthew what now? Yeah, right, uh, right at the beginning of Matthew, the yeah, what's Matthew have to say about it? Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah, and his right. brothers, Judah, the father of Perez. Okay, so it's going from Judah. So, yeah. Okay. There you have it. Line of Judah. Should have known that. But, yeah. And what was the question on that? <laughs> yeah. So, if they're keeping track, and I'm. So, somebody I with read the, that. Most Jews today are from Judah. Mm -hmm. if they trace it back, so they could be still trade yeah. looking for. That's a great question. Yeah, we need a rabbi in here to talk about this stuff. <laughs> need a guest in. Yeah, yeah. How are we doing on our time? So, um, yeah. So, um, any other questions or thoughts about the Book of Hosea? <coughs> There's some good things. <coughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, uh, I'm looking for it. I can't seem to find it. Oh, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. I mean, God's, God's um, constant uh, cajoling for people to understand who God is um, and the desire. You, they will be my people and I will be their God. You know, it shows up over and over and over again. And even though God is so frustrated with the Israelites in, in Hosea, th there, there's no way that that is going to remain that way because God's love is beyond anything that we can can even grasp. And the, the whole uh, 14 from 8, eight and 9, um, God is so appealing, you know, to them. Please, 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 almost begging um, for, for them to understand how much they are loved and all that God is asking them to do back is to be faithful. Um, humans just can't do it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, and that, you're right. That is a common thread that's woven throughout the Hebrew Bible and through the New Testament as well. And the idea, so going back to your original, like the struggle between the hierarchical gender differences and the inequality, of, you know, you don't see the, the wife, the prophetess whose husband's walking out on her all the time. In fact, that's not, you know, it's not in there. Um, other than that window, that small curtain we get with King David. That's pretty much the only place I can really think. And Judah, uh, who uh, you slept, know, with, his slept with his daughter in law because she, he wouldn't follow through on what he, was, he had promised her. Um, but I think it's so it's an attempt, and maybe we think of a different way to, to kind of describe this. But the human heart, uh, so you have this intimate love and trust relationship, a vulnerability with somebody, and they crush it. They betray your, they betray your trust, they betray your vows, they, they basically blindside you with this infidelity, whatever that looks like. And so again and again we see in the prophets this inexplicable, like, a human being would most likely say, I'm out, although Hosea is told to persist, so he does. But God, that analogy of God saying, I won't, you have been uh, the unfaithful party in this. You've broken my trust, but I'm not, I'm still here. I'm not giving up on this. So the thing that I often think about when people talk about grace like, what the heck is grace? We can understand forgiveness, but amazing grace. What does that mean? What is grace? And for my running definition of grace is this. Think of whatever it is that somebody could do, a friend, uh, an enemy, a coworker, a spouse, a kid. Kid's probably the toughest of that bunch. Would do, that would bring you to the place or the point where you say, you've broken me so much 
I can't be in relationship with you anymore. I, I'm out. I'm done. I still love you, but it's, we're not going to have what we had at any level because it's just too darn painful. So imagine whatever that looks like for you. And then imagine a God who says, there is no breaking point for me. And that's grace. And it's insane. Like, we, we, we would call that abuse. Like, we would call that abuse to the God. Like, uh, this is a dysfunctional relationship. Why, would, why the heck wouldn't you flood the place again? <laughs> you know? Um, but that's the amazing, that's the, you can break my body. You can nail me to a tree, mock me, insult me. It's the same kind of embodiment of the cross. Do your worst. Put me through hell and back in this earthly life, and I will come back loving you. Wow. We don't do that with each other. We probably, that's probably a healthy thing at some level that we don't do that. You know, we draw a healthy boundary because it's just humanly tough. But the idea that there's never an exhaustion of chance with God is... uh, it's, it's why all those parables Jesus tells about like the workers in the field and the guy comes and hires people for the last half hour and they get paid the same amount that the guys who have been working all day. It's not fair. It doesn't make sense. It's not how we would do things. Um, well, it's kind of like how you know, the guest preacher talks in the sermon about <coughs> the, the, the person who never had a with mother. Yeah. And when she talked about that, I thought, I thought of a lot of people, not a lot of people, people I've known over the years that had uh, very um, stretched relationships with their mothers, with yeah. their forefathers. Yeah. Um, and how, what that might look like. Especially when somebody dies and you haven't yeah. kind of finalized your feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So... Yeah, that's a really poignant place. It was tough, I think, for a lot of people because that's right at home. Hits close to the mark. Um, So you're right. The the book of Hosea kind of unfolds that grace side of God. And in the words of Clint Eastwood, in in Unforgiven, deserves got nothing to do with it. We We all have it coming. But unlike that movie, grace keeps coming. So it's uh, yeah, it's a tough it's a tough book. It's on a lot of levels kind of icky, um, but it also has this beautiful underside of the level of God's commitment to the people, even when they're out. So um, next week uh, I'm going to be subbing bullpen for Pastor Michelle. It's, you have her on the on the docket, but I'm going to be subbing for her. So we're going to do Joel or Joel, and uh, I believe it's Amos and Hey Guy. Is it Hey Guy? Obadiah. Oh, Obadiah. Oh. So read those three. Uh, they're different verses, different. And and as you read them, uh, who's the prophet? A prophet too. Is it Israel? We want to keep these minor prophets because they're going to blur together. Is it Israel that we're working with or is it Judah we're working with or both? Um, And what's their primary calling in that prophetic? What's their primary prophetic word? There's going to be a lot of overlap, a lot of similarities in a lot of these minor prophets. But there will be a few that are really (coughs) way out there different than the rest we read. So the context will be different uh, for each one. So we'll tackle those three, particularly when we're reading Amos. Be thinking about what you read in Hosea and be thinking about some of the the microscopic things. I mean, when you think of Amos, you think, uh, uh, what does the Lord require but to love, to walk, uh, to do just, uh, love mercy, walk justly, and uh, walk humbly before your God. And let mercy roll down like waters, like an ever-flowing stream. Uh, those texts are really famously, one of them's Micah, one of them's Amos. I just misquoted one of them. But uh, th- that's kind of the thing that stands out at Amos. You're going to see a lot of things in Amos that you probably haven't heard before. The plumb line, uh, basket full of figs, it goes bad. Uh, these different signs that Amos has. I want you to really focus on, particularly in the modern context, 
the prophetic challenge to a people who is comfortable and living high on life at the cost of others that they, they don't either acknowledge or think about, even think about. And what that might mean for us in our society that lives pretty well comparatively to the rest of the world and comparatively to others in our society. Uh, what, what, is, what does God say about ignoring um, the poor, the marginalized, and the weakest amongst you? And it's not a good thing. <laughs> so until next time.